Hey, good afternoon, everyone. So welcome, uh, welcome to my talk. My name is Yu Hao, and I'm the director of engineering from Datavisor. And in this talk, I'll be presenting our fraud detection platform using AI and big data technologies. So this is the structure of my talk. I'm going to kick off with an introduction about the common tools that's used uh, to fight against fraud. And then uh, I'll dive into the unsupervised machine learning platform that Datavisor built. And then last but not least, I'm going to identify some key challenges that we meet in, uh, in scaling and production. So before I get into the tools uh, that, um, uh, about, uh, that's, that's used to fight against fraud, let me briefly introduce our company in case that uh, you guys don't know who we are. So Datavisor is a startup founded in late 2013, and we are focusing on providing fraud detection solutions to our customers. And uh, we are, so right now we have a team of about 150, and we are experts in machine learning, big data, and security. And we are particularly specializing in building unsupervised machine learning platform. That's what we believe to be the future of machine learning. And our service can run on both cloud and on-premise solutions. And thanks to our platform, we have a lot of clients, uh, including those top branded names in the world, in different industries, such as social, gaming, e-commerce, and finance. So the motivation uh, of our founders who uh, started this company is to fight against online fraud. As the development of the internet, so people's life uh, got significantly easier, we can virtually do a lot of things from the web or mobile devices. But keep in mind that the fraudster and attackers also benefit from the advance of, advancement of technology. And actually, if you search around the web, you can see uh, the abuse uh, and fraudulent activities from the web every single week. And it's causing, uh, it's causing hundreds of billions of dollars um, of, of loss uh, to the world uh, every year. So, uh, to, and traditionally, there are roughly four techniques to fight against fraud. That is reputation list or device fingerprint, and rules engine, and supervised machine learning, and finally, unsupervised machine learning. And I'm going to do a comparison among them. So, uh, first one on the list, uh, reputation list. So essentially how it works is to maintain a blacklist uh, of the known bad identities, such as email address, uh, IP address, or uh, device fingerprints. So the way how the detection system works is pretty straightforward. So it's just going to do a match with the system. So if match any blacklisted, blacklisted identity, we detect that uh, as fraudulent activity or fraudulent users. But apparently, the limitation of this is, um, is very straightforward because uh, the, the, the reputation database is static. It's unable to capture any dynamic uh, identity, such as for email address, we, we now have one-time email address generator, so we can generate uh, random email addresses. And for device fingerprints, now we have all kinds of emulators that we, that we can generate whatever device fingerprint um, it needs. So it's very easy to bypass this system. So Roots Engine is, um, is a step up on top of that. Instead of uh, uh, doing um, a pattern match, Roots, Roots Engine is trying to detect the fraudulent activity from the account characteristic perspective or behavior perspective. So for example, account age uh, could be treated as one of the account characteristics. And generally speaking, the longer the account, uh, the more benign the account could be. It's just like our credit history. And also, we can do the detection based on the, uh, based on the behavior. And we can calculate some simple, um, what we call features, uh, in terms of the machine learning uh, terminology uh, to do the detections on top of that. So compared with reputation list, this works a lot better. And also, uh, the system is very, very easy to understand by human, because it's written by human language, pretty much. Uh, but the limitation of this is it's really painful to maintain the, uh, the rule list, especially when it uh, gets large. So we will end up with a situation that rules are fighting with each, each other all the time. And also, the rule list, um, uh, if the attacker turns out to know uh, the, um, how the rule system works, it's very easy for them to, de to design an attack pattern that to, bypass it, to bypass this system. So on top of that, supervised machine learning is a step up uh, um, uh, against rules engine. And Technically speaking, uh, supervised machine learning is, um, is a mathematical model or algorithm to approximate um, uh, the rule list or the, or the rules engine. So uh, the, the key thing here for the supervised machine learning, or let's call it SML for short, to work is to have a large amount of training data such that uh, the algorithm will automatically figure out what is good and what is bad. So those training data um, is to tell the system what is good and what is bad. And and, and then the system will figure out it itself. 
So the biggest limitation of this approach came from the training data. Bec uh, on one hand, we usually need a large amount of training data uh, in order to uh, the system to figure out. We need like uh, hundreds of thousands of training samples uh, to, uh, to converge. So uh, generating those training labels is very labor intensive. It typically comes from either uh, manual review or it came from customer complaints or, or abuse reports. So you probably don't want that to happen. You want to catch it uh, ahead of time. And another problem of the, uh, of the training data is the quality of the training data. Because your model can be as good as the training data. If your training data does not capture any particular attack patterns, it's very difficult for the algorithm to, uh, to catch that. So with new attack patterns, SML usually fails to, uh, to capture that. And that's why people need to constantly tune the SML model and retrain the model to, uh, to keep in pace. So last but not least, unsupervised machine learning is an algorithm that, that can figure out um, unusual patterns within the data without telling the system what is good and what is bad uh, 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 ahead. So uh, that's a, hu a huge advantage of, um, against uh, SML because we get rid of the training data. And that saves a lot of uh, human efforts to generate the, the, uh, uh, the data. Uh, but I would say the drawback of um, uh, UML and supervised machine learning is that on one hand, uh, the system does require some tuning, uh, but it's usually one-time effort, and then uh, the system will just work. And then um, an another drawback of UML is very computationally expensive because it's going to, uh, as, I, as I dig in more into, into our architecture, it, takes, uh, uh, it requires like thousands of um, computation power compared with uh, SML. But here is the brief um, com comparison uh, among uh, all the approach uh, that I just mentioned. So device fingerprint is a very static approach, and it's limited. It has very limited uh, coverage of, of the detection results. Rules engine is a step up uh, against that, but it's really painful to maintain the rule set. SML model is another step up against rules engine, but the biggest drawback comes from the, uh, the training data because of the quantity of the data and quality of the data. And finally, unsupervised machine learning is what we believe to be the future of machine learning, but uh, it's computationally expensive and it's also quite challenging to tune. So with that, let's switch gear to dig into our DataWise's unsupervised machine learning platform. So this is the overall architecture of our platform. Uh, we split it into three steps. The first step is what we call feature extractions, and I'll dig into that uh, just in a little bit. And with the feature uh, ex uh, extracted from the raw data, we will run our um, unsupervised machine learning algorithm to detect the fraudulent activities. And finally, we have a result uh, ranking system that, uh, that gives a human readable result to our customers such that they can take real actions on the detection results. So the first step of, um, uh, of actually both SML and, um, and um, unsupervised machine learning is called feature engineering. And it's extremely important for, for any machine learning system because uh, essentially uh, the feature uh, is, the, is the high dimen dimensional space that, uh, either, that uh, any machine learning algorithm uh, will work on. Without proper feature engineering, the algorithm will be working on the wrong dimensional space. So it's, it's basically like garbage in and garbage out. It's impossible for the, for the algorithm to figure out a pattern. So thanks to our domain knowledge on a lot of industries, so we, de uh, we derive thousands of premium features uh, uh, in, in different domains. And what we found is uh, uh, we, can, we can easily recommend the most effective feature uh, um, according to the industry domains. For example, we have a social domain, gaming, do gaming e-commerce, and finance domain. So uh, not, not all the features are equivalent uh, across those domains. But again, uh, we, we have a huge database of uh, uh, different of clients, so we can easily recommend the most effective uh, features uh, on that. And then with proper feature engineering, here comes to the unsupervised machine learning magic. So uh, instead of going to the, um, to the crazy ma mathematic model of that, uh, intuitively speaking, the unsupervised machine learning algorithm is trying to find out those uh, behavior that's extremely unlikely to uh, happen uh, in the normal circumstances by doing the uh, probabilistic calculation. And, and, that, and, and that's what we call a cluster. So a cluster is an unusual similarity uh, uh, among, uh, among the data. And, that's the, and our algorithm will work uh, on top of the thousands of features. And apparently, that's not going to happen uh, because uh, there are too much computation power. And we actually did a lot of uh, optimizations on that, including like uh, dimension reductions um, uh, on, a, uh, on, a, uh, on a heuristic uh, basis. And we also have a heuristic search uh, solutions to greatly reduce uh, the search space uh, of the computation. Uh, with that, we make our 
we, we make our system possible uh, in the cloud. So next step, once we have the cluster, we actually do graph analysis uh, among those clusters. And in my own words, I would usually refer this as a uh, cluster of clusters. So uh, the reason why we are doing that is because uh, by doing so, uh, we can identify some of the deep connections or deep um, abnormally among the data, such that uh, we can catch uh, some fraudulent activities that, that, that's, not, that that's not even uh, possible to catch from an individual perspective. And I do have an example of, um, of showing that um, just in a little bit. So with both uh, cluster analysis and graph analysis, we have, uh, the, we have detected uh, those bad users. The next step of our system is to generate uh, to generate detection score such that our, um, our clients can take actions on that. Because um, machine learning model is sometimes really hard to understand, uh, although our people know it works. So uh, in, in order for our, for our client to take actions on that, we will provide a confidence scores about how confident we are uh, on those, on those uh, detection results. And the score depends on the size of the clusters and also uh, the, uh, the level of suspiciousness uh, in terms of uh, its uh, similarity. And on top of the scores, we actually uh, we we also generate the recent code and cat uh, categorization on the detection results, such that our client could have fine-grained control of uh, what kind of uh, action they want to perform against different attack patterns. And last but not least, we have uh, we have a sophisticated UI uh, to help our customer understand uh, what's going on with the, their online ecosystem, either from a 3,000 feet uh, perspective, uh, capturing all the high-level um, characteristic uh, of the uh, of the ecosystem, or down to the campaign perspective, or all the way down to individual uh, user uh, perspective, such that um, our customer can have uh, confidence uh, to know what's going on and why we detect um, a user as bad. Uh, and this is uh, used for uh, menu review and data analysis purposes. So uh, with all the platforms, uh, I apologize for the, for the fronts I'm mixing around, but we, have, uh, we identify lots of uh, successful use cases, uh, including the um, uh, fake account registration, uh, fraudulent uh, transactions, uh, fake review and likes, uh, and, and, and so on. It, it really depends on uh, different industries, but uh, the core is um, our unsupervised machine learning algorithm. And here, I particularly want to highlight one of the examples to reveal the power of unsupervised machine learning. So once in a while, uh, we, depend, uh, we detect, um, uh, we detect um, a group of fraudulent users that contains 15,000 of, um, uh, of users. And actually, from an individual level, all, the, all, all those accounts look very benign because attackers are actually using real device and real human to, uh, to, do, uh, to perform them. Uh, the activity, and this is what they call the device farm, and they're, re they're really doing a good job in mimicking a, a real human. But once we group all of these uh, fraudulent uh, users uh, as, a, as a whole, uh, we can clearly see some unusual suspiciousness of that. So for example, all the device, uh, most of the devices are coming from a Xiaomi uh, brand uh, phone, that's a very popular brand in China. Uh, but uh, and clearly the brand distribution is uh, is way off from the normal distribution, and also uh, in terms of its behavioral detections, uh, its behavioral patterns, all the accounts are created within a one week window, and uh, after the one week uh, creation, uh, they actually try to simulate some simulate some account. Uh, retention activities by launching the app for uh, a few seconds to a few minutes just to mimic uh, the human activity to, to treat the system know this is a real this is a real human but because of the unsupervised machine learning we catch them as a whole and again that's the power of um, of our grouping algorithm if we look at if you look them uh, at an individual le uh, level it's impossible to catch them so next, uh, I'm going to switch key into identifying some of the key challenges that we, uh, that we meet uh, in our production. And actually, that's the difference between an idea and a product, uh, and a product because we need to make it work. So uh, first of all, I want to point out that uh, serving, machine learning serving machine learning in production is very, very challenging. I, I want to quote a paper published by Google in 2015. Uh, and what they did is to count the lines of code according, according to the functionality within the project. And what they found is the machine learning code, uh, that's the circle in the middle, it's only probably less than 5% uh, of the project, while they refer the rest of the project as plumbing. But clearly, uh, in a machine learning uh, project, the plumbing work is the dominant uh, uh, work in, uh, in the whole project, and, and, we need to, and, we need, and, and we need to solve that. So let's take one uh, of our data product as example. So that's what we call global intelligence network. 
So essentially, it's a reputation database. But I know uh, you might be thinking about what's the difference between the 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 other reputation data database uh, that I uh, that I that I present in the at the beginning. Uh, our reputation our reputation database can actually take multiple. Um, multi multiple identity into account and uh, do a fusion of them to come up with one final score where, uh, as a detection score. So for example, we can take uh, IP address, uh, device ID, and phone number, and we have a model to, fu uh, to fusion them into, into one single detection score. Uh, that's, um, that's a lot better than, uh, than, uh, than the traditional blacklist model. And the way how, how, it, how it works is uh, we combine both unsupervised machine learning uh, and deep learning. Technically, deep, deep learning is a kind of um, a supervised machine learning. So uh, we use unsupervised machine learning to generate the training labels uh, because, um, because, because UML does not require a label at all. And once we have the label, we actually feed that into the deep learning pipeline to train an efficient model to, um, to, to get a high quality deep learning model. And finally, one, uh, we can uh, just serve production traffic using the uh, using the deep learning using the deep learning model. So that looks pretty straightforward. But then the next question is: uh, which which platform are we going to use? Uh, well, we are. We are interested in both Spark and TensorFlow, and we are actually in a dilemma of uh, picking uh, one of them because they both have pros and cons. Spark is particularly good at data processing, uh, and it's very scalable uh, because of its, uh, its uh, distributed uh, computation. While the, on the other hand, TensorFlow is, a pretty, is a particularly good in doing uh, the deep learning work, uh, either training or serving. So as a result, uh, we actually combine the advantage of both of them, uh, but the majority of our pipeline are written in Spark. So about 80 percent, and then with that, uh, the optimization of the, that makes our optimization work very straightforward, because uh, clearly the first part to optimize our system is to optimize our Spark platform, and that's uh, and um, a couple of years ago we built our own in-house uh, Spark uh, in infrastructure. That's what we call Datavisor Spark Generator, and. Um, Intuitively speaking, so uh, we adopt a very simple approach called one job per cluster uh, that we launch, launch a cluster for every single job. And then as soon as the job are finished, we shut down the cluster. And we actually find out a lot of the benefits of doing that. Uh, one of the benefits is, um, is the pricing, uh, because uh, by, by doing so, uh, we don't need to maintain any long-running clusters. And we can actually utilize the Amazon EC2 spot fleet, which is seven times cheaper than on demand. And thanks to the resiliency of Spark, uh, in case of machine failure, um, uh, we can uh, just backfill with a new machines, and then the Spark system will uh, we re automatically recover from that, as long as it's not autom uh, as long as it's only a small portion of machine failures. And also, uh, our unif our unified um, Spark generator platform can take uh, can take uh, both uh, the production traffic uh, and development job into account. So for production uh, for production jobs. Uh, we have uh, we, we use Luigi as our workflow uh, manager, uh, such that uh, or AKA scheduler to run a job uh, when it becomes ready. So um, previously, without one job per cluster, uh, when we have a static cluster view, so uh, all the jobs needs to be uh, executed in serial. Uh, but uh, with with one job per cluster, we can actually have maximum parallelism of that. As, lo as long as the job becomes uh, ready, we can just launch a new cluster to, uh, to run that. So as a result, uh, it cut the pipeline latency by 50%. And also, it, it, it eliminates the annoying prioritization problem that we, uh, that we used to have before. Because in our pipeline, some jobs are, are higher priority, and we definitely want to prioritize them. But once we have one job per cluster, there is no priori prioritization, because we treat all the jobs uh, as first class citizen. And there's actually one more advantage of doing the one job per cluster, because all the clusters um, will be no longer long running. And it's very easy to do infrastructure um, upgrade or release version controls. And here I'm talking about both application code uh, version control as well as infrastructure, um, the machine image control. For those who ever perform security patch management, you know what I'm talking about. So, Traditionally speaking, uh, if uh, we have a long-running machine, uh, we need to apply security patches to the, to the machines and reboot the machine. That's very, very painful. But with one drop per cluster, uh, all the machine will be short-living. And uh, uh, let's say they will live uh, then less than 24 hours. So um, all we need to do is to just apply the security patches to the, machine, uh, to the machine image and then wait for a day. And then the whole infrastructure will be refreshed. And that's it. So I would like to um, uh, end it here without digging uh, into too deep. 
So uh, that's the summary of our um, DataWise Spark infrastructure system uh, that it managed to um, increase the peak scale by four times while we reduce the pipeline latency by 50%, and also it saves cloud costs by five times compared with the um, uh, naive on-demand uh, approach. And uh, it also saves a lot of operational cost. So I would like to end my talk um, with, the, uh, with a quote of the Google paper again. To serve machine learning platform in, uh, in production, the required surrounding infrastructure is vast and complex. And we would like to really thank Amazon for building uh, the reliable and scalable um, platform to make all of this happen. So with that, uh, that's all I have uh, for my talk. You guys are welcome to connect to me uh, offline. Thank you. Thank you for having us.